So this was me last week uh, filming for Winter Watch. So I do a little bit of TV every now and again. I did a piece um, on Rutland Water doing a big bait ball of, of fish um, that was there. But when I'm not doing that, I work with a, a huge array of, of different kind of species, but with a particular focus on the underwater world. Um, I'm a big fan of dragonflies and damselflies, obviously, because I spend a hell of a lot of time by rivers and ponds and lakes filming what's underneath uh, them. I get to see a wide array of species. This banded damsel, one of my favourites. I always think it's one of the first signs of summer. Summer's really hit when you see those banded damsels fluttering up and down the riverbank. So one of my favourite species to, uh, to see there. But it's normally the larval form of all these different dragonflies and damselflies that I tend to encounter more and that I enjoy filming a little bit more and photographing a little bit more. They're just so alien and different and most of us just don't get to see them. Or I guess a, a lot of you do because you're obviously quite interested in uh, dragonflies and, and damselflies, but the wider public don't. Um, and of course this time of year in the winter, then they're still relatively active. But when it comes to ponds, um, there's a few species that we kind of cover and we look at, and amphibians are another kind of group of species that people maybe overlook a little bit, frogs in particular. And I've spent a few years photographing uh, and, and filming frogs of, of various species. And it's basically trying to find the, the perfect pond, which sounds quite sad when I say it out loud, but trying to find that pond that has got gin clear water, uh, interesting backgrounds, uh, to allow me to get these underwater pictures and you have to get timing absolutely spot on as, as many of you will do for kind of emerging dragonflies likewise if you're you know a week or two late they've already spawned a week or two early they're not quite happened yet so timing is very very key um, for it so I knew that when I wanted to take pictures of frogs spawning um, it was trying to find clear water it was trying to find a pond with an interesting array of plants and things in there um, and, and kind of the right light and all these different things. And I didn't, didn't find it for years and years and years. And then a couple of years ago, um, there was a pond in, in Froggit, of all places, the, it was called Froggit in the Peak District. And it was just a spring fed, very shallow pond full of frogs. And I thought, this is great. I can do some underwater pictures. So I did the top side image first as this wide angle. Um, the frogs are so engrossed with each other that they didn't mind me getting in the water. Um, and, I'm, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how I take some of these shots later on, but kind of get in there, frogs were mating, getting stuck into it in, in as normal way as you can get excited about this. Not too excited because that should probably be illegal, but excited enough that I'm, I'm trying to get these images to, uh, to kind of infuse the public about these less like species. Uh, but the underwater side, it just connects two worlds. And particularly when you're doing split level photography, it's one of my favorite kinds of photography because you get to see a little bit above the surface, which is what we're familiar with. And then you get to see below the surface as well with these frogs um, kind of in there. And I'm using, I'm not a very technical photographer, if I'm honest, but I, am, I use a little bit of flash here just to illuminate that a little bit as well. I'd love to do these kind of shots with dragonfly larvae. Can you imagine that? Great. Dragonfly larvae really close up to the camera or um, I know banded damosel females, they go under the water to lay their eggs. Something like that with this would be phenomenal, but I've just not had the, uh, the opportunity yet but it's something I would like to, to do a little bit of. So these frogs took something like four years of going to different places so it, it, it's it's a marathon it's not a sprint with this sort of photography it's kind of picking the right place and then just keep going back each year so I've kind of got a diary of nature events and I'll keep going back to them year in year out and it's amazing how they can differ from years how sometimes as I say they're earlier they're later and um, seasons and weather affects them it's um it's citizen science in many respects, but I, obviously I'm not really doing it for that. I'm doing it to just take pictures, but there is a, an element of that to it. And ponds are just such an underrated habitat uh, in, in general, but certainly in photography, very few people. Um, I mean, there's myself, uh, Neil Phillips is another very talented pond photographer. There's about five or six of us. We could kind of do pond hermits, to be honest. There are a few of us there are, but um, there's, there are amazing habitats to get some images of them. Most people are not going to jump in a pond and take pictures, admittedly, but there are all kinds of, of ways around that and different images that you can take when you're down there. Newts are one that I've done a little bit of work with. These are smooth newts, you know, which can make, make fantastic subjects, kind of the more common species. Again, it's that clear water. This was a, a woman's swimming pond, which is a great concept. I love the idea of having a swimming pond who uh, she lived in uh, Retford. 
and she had newts and all kinds of crazy uh, invertebrates in there. It's an amazing habitat. Things like diving beetle larvae, you know, the size of a 50p coin, all these diving beetle larvae swimming around there. So it's a great habitat. If I could have a slightly bigger garden, I would definitely have a, have a swimming pond. Um, and if you're lucky, you might get things like great crested newts. So where I'm in Nottinghamshire, um, I wouldn't say they're common, but they're in a lot of ponds locally, whereas you can go to other parts of the country and they're almost completely gone. So they tend to be, although we always think of them as rare because they're protected, they tend to be locally abundant. So depending where you are in the country, they might be everywhere or you might have absolutely none. So I've done a little bit of work with these um, under license over the years. And again, talking about timings, the shot I really want to get is a, is a male with a really big, impressive uh, crest. But this, this kind, of, he, he kind of, his crest is looking a bit limp if I'm honest, not quite the shot I was hoping for, but it's one of those things I need to go back and have a have another go for it at some point. Sometimes shots just come by by accident. Sometimes it's something that you can't plan. So I tend to plan my shoots fairly meticulously, but then things just happen. So this is the same swimming pond I mentioned earlier, and the, and the woman who owned it said that she had grass snakes uh, around the margins. And I sort of, yeah, yeah, okay, I didn't take it too seriously, but went in the pond to photograph the beetles and whatnot. And sure enough, there was a grass snake in the lily pads. So, you know, you can't plan. For it. it's, it's the kind of shot that if I went to go and do on purpose, I'd probably never get it. But because it was there in the moment, I was just approaching it very slowly. I was able to get this image. Now, I think there's two reasons why I got it. One is because all it could see was my head. And obviously, if you can just see my head, it's not that threatening. But also, if you look at its eye, it's very milky. And that's because it's about to shed its skin. So it couldn't see me very well. I think had this grass snake not been shedding its skin, then it probably would have um, it would have just gone away. It would have it would have slunk away. So I was able to uh, able to get that shot really through look as well as a little bit of skill, I suppose. Uh, but they are they are quite aquatic as well. A lot of people don't realise that grass snakes spend a hell of a lot of time under the water and uh, and in and around margins, really eating all manner of subjects. So if you don't want to get in the pond and take the photography that way, there are always ways around it. And certainly during lockdown. Uh, I couldn't go in ponds because you know I wasn't really allowed out. So I brought the pond to me, and the way that I did that was do tank photography. And I think this is something that everyone can have a go at. Um, you know, you can get a cheap glass tank from, say, you know, Wilco's or wherever you, wherever you can buy one of these things, and you can uh, put whatever will fit in there, and you can get some amazing images and some pretty interesting ones with a macro lens. So it's a relatively cheap way of taking underwater, well, I say underwater, not technically underwater, but underwater looking images. So this is what I normally do if I photograph dragonfly larvae or um, pond invertebrates or small fish, I'll actually put them in a tank and take pictures that way. So I just put them in my shed. I'll bring them home, put them in my shed. You can do it on location as well. So say if you're working with very sensitive species or species that aren't gonna do well, you know, traveling, then you can do it on location. So there are options around it. I would actually say that tank photography is really, really difficult because you can bung an animal in a tank and take a picture, but to make it look good is tricky. This is a, a glass seal, an elder that I, that I put in the tank and, and got that way. Because the river I was photographing in the Severn, it's really murky. You wouldn't be able to see anything. So by putting it in a tank, I'm enabling myself to get, get those images. But they can look a little bit um, staged, I suppose, sometimes. So this is a small trout. And straight away, the, the rocks look a little bit off. The, the Canadian pond weed is a, is a dead giveaway. It doesn't look very natural. So it, it's quite tricky. You'd think it's really easy. You think, you know, shoot, shoot without using the expression shooting fish in a barrel, but shooting fish in a tank instead. But it is quite, um, it's quite hard to do. And, I, you know, it's great fun to, to get used to it and kind of get, um, get the good images out of that. But once you get the hang of it, you can make it look really natural. I think the key is background. So just having a, a, a decent background, lots of natural, um, lots of natural sticks and things like that in there, and you know, nice green back. If it's a pond, then green's always a good background. It helps if the animals move. You know, you don't want the animal on the bottom looking sad. You know, looking a bit, uh, a bit deflated. You want it moving. You want it doing some kind of action, some sort of uh, behavior if you can. So this newt coming up for air, and then it slowly sinks down able to get a, a shot of it that way as well. You can get more artistic images as well. So frog spawn uh, and a tadpole. So on you, not, you wouldn't normally see them together, but because my pond is on a slant, the frog spawn in the shallow water develops quicker than the frog spawn in the deeper water. So in the shallow water, they'd all transform, but in the deeper water, they were still 
clumped of spawns, was able to get this sort of juxtaposition of uh, different different life stages in the same in the same image. But you know, within reason, anything that fits in a in a glass tank, you can get really interesting uh, images. And and if you've got a garden pond at home, as I'm sure many of you do, because you're all you know dragonfly fanatics, then you can do this at home, and you know you don't have to go very far to take interesting images. So I did a lot of this during lockdown. Uh, basically, I just got stuck into my uh, to my garden pond, my previous garden pond. I'll show you my new one in a second, but that was my old one. And then in my uh, in my shed, I've got a big kind of a large aquarium which I can put bigger uh, things like big pike and stuff like that in there if I really want to. So that's kind of a, a little bit more of an extreme way of doing it. But there's there's all kinds of options that you can play around with. You know, things like this is another trout just moving through there, little baby trout. So it's good for close ups um, and just shots that would be really tricky to get. I think in the winter, like. And we'd do some rain. So I wouldn't be able to film in a river then because it'd be too murky. But I can carry on doing it in a tank. So it does give you other other options for different kinds of, of photography. Um, let's do some dragonfly porn. So uh, golden ring dragonfly. This is my absolute favourite dragonfly. I think they're absolutely phenomenal. I've not seen many adults. I've only seen a few. And this, this was um, halfway up a, a mountain in the Lake District because I know they're quite... Um, kind of acidic loving species but the adult was huge I, I can't remember I don't think they're I think they might be the longest dragonfly I mean you guys will know a lot better than me but they're they're not the biggest they're the longest or something like they're up there anyway I know they're they're kind of top tier dragonflies in the UK but phenomenal looking creature um, and I've, I've seen them on some of the chalk streams down south as well but I really do unfortunately as typically it would do when you've got your camera it landed on this horrible bit of metal I guess because of the warmth it wouldn't land somewhere quite pretty um, but it was amazing to see that. And then I started to learn about the, uh, the, the larvae of these dragonflies and what they do, which I'll come on to. I've put the wrong slide in here. It's meant to be a dragonfly larvae, not bags of fish. Uh, the reason I've got bags of fish is because during lockdown, I, I, I couldn't go to the, the subject. So I brought the subjects to me. So I actually got fish sent to me so I could take pictures of those um, in, in my shed and then ended up getting shots uh, like this. So you can get kind of images that you wouldn't necessarily expect. So even during lockdown, I was still able to get, get those. There we go, there's a golden ring dragonfly larvae. Those slides are out of place. Um, the, the camouflage on them is phenomenal. I know that most dragonfly larvae are very well camouflaged, but these are just on another level. Um, you, I was going with a little pond dipping net to try and scoop them up. And once you got your eye in, they're everywhere, but trying to spot them with the naked eye is really, really tricky. And what I wanted to do, um, was get more natural shots of dragonfly larvae. So I, I like getting the shots in the tank, but these kind of shots in environment, because you very rarely see it. You very rarely see wild shots of dragonfly larvae. I guess because most of them aren't big enough to show up meaningfully, uh, and, and they're quite tricky, but they were, uh, they were great to work with. And these golden ring dragonfly larvae, that, that were the previous one, sorry, that wasn't a golden ring, that was some kind of forker, but um, th these are golden ring dragonfly larvae. And what I really wanted to get was it hunting? Because what they do is bury into the substrate and then they remain motionless. And then when something goes above them, they just reach up and grab it. And I thought that'd be an amazing little wildlife sequence to, uh, to try and film that. But as wildlife often uh, does, it didn't quite work out. And this is a mayfly larvae that's actually grazing on top of the head of this dragonfly larvae and it, it didn't it didn't the dragonfly is perfectly fine it's not i mean whether it had just eaten i don't know but i was i was just waiting and waiting and waiting for it to snatch this mayfly larvae and then uh, no it was it, it got to the point where it was quite happy to let it eat off its head so it didn't quite work out so it's something i'm gonna have to revisit but i would like to do some more filming of dragonfly larvae kind of hunting uh, various prey prey items so i moved house in in june i've been waiting for ages and i got my house and I knew that I needed a pond in my garden and I had to, the house was needed a bit of TLC first. So I, I did this temporary pond in my front garden, which is basically a little 20 pound fiberglass pond. Looks ugly, but it does the job. It, it's got some uh, plants in there, probably a little bit small for dragonfly larvae, I guess for lots of them, but you might get a few living in there and certainly the adults would use that. But over time, after I'd got the house done, I knew, okay, we can start working on the back garden. And I, First kind of planned out roughly where I wanted the pond to be, um, dug, dug the perimeter, dug, dug out the lawn, and I tried to pick somewhere that got a little bit of sun uh, and a little bit of shade, not just sun all day, not just shade all day. 
and it took a while i had some friends to help me that kind of gives you scale so you know i'm about six foot so the pond's fairly deep we've got some shelves in there put loads of stones in and that's what it looked like before so my garden was pretty featureless pretty much a wildlife uh barren of wildlife really had nothing in it and i've tried to turn it into a little mini nature reserve now um i say mini because it's not a huge garden but that's what the pond looked like when i'd uh finished digging it i'm a i'm a stickler for for hiding liner i mean at the end of the day wildlife don't care if there's a bit of liner showing but it really it's kind of like an OCD. I don't like liners showing with a wildlife pond. So I've put all these stones, which I got for free. I just went on Facebook Marketplace and people give them away. All this sandstone to hide the liner. But then there's all that nooks and crannies. That's perfect for insects to hide in, for the plants to root in. So that work looked quite nice. That was during the summer. And I took this this morning. So this is a fresh image, not a particularly good image, but it gives you an idea of what the pond looks like a few months later. I've left the grass around it. I'm going to let that grow. I've put some wildflowers in there. I've put some bulbs in there. So come the spring, that'll be full of invertebrates, um, full of flowers, and should be ideal for dragonflies. And if you read any of the kind of textbook pond wildlife gardening books, they always say, oh, you know, you'll get wildlife within a week or two of, of building. And I've always been very sceptical of that. But within a week, I did have water boatmen. I had diving beetles, small diving beetles. And I had a drag. I didn't get a look at what species it was, but I had a big hawker or an emperor, one of them, laying eggs in my pond. So I thought, you know what? If you build it, they will come. So I was really chuffed with that. Um, how do I take this underwater photography um, when I'm when I'm doing it? There's a few different ways. Uh, pole cam is very popular. I, I quite like using a pole cam. So I've got a, a little GoPro or, or similar camera that goes on the end of a pole, shimmy it out. Sometimes I use a monitor. Sometimes I don't. Depends what kind of gear I'm using. And this is a great way of working with very spooky and sensitive subjects. So it just means that you can very slowly uh, approach them and you're not interfering too much. If you're working in urban areas, it's a great way of getting images because you might not want to jump in a, in a canal in the middle of London or something like that. Um, and also, as I say, during the, the colder months, it just means that you can get images without entering the water. So pole cam is quite popular. And any of you can put a small camera on the end of a pole and, uh, and give that a, a little go. My favorite method is snorkeling. I absolutely love being in the river, being in the pond. There's, you can't beat wild swimming and, and just immersing yourself uh, in that particular environment. And particularly if you've got a camera. Um, <laughs> sorry, you can probably hear my, my dog's in the office when she's grumbling. Um, and uh, just being in that water is just, is just fantastic being in there. So snorkeling is a great, I mean, even in the winter, like the, the winter watch shoot I did last week, middle of the, the uh, middle of the, November cold I love it I don't mind it I absolutely love getting stuck into it and it just means that you can get different angles and a bit more freedom than what you can do with a pole camera or, or doing it remotely so um, snorkeling is a great way of, of getting those kind of images I guess scuba diving is, is the kind of the one up and I don't really scuba dive that often despite mainly doing underwater photography um, I'm not I don't scuba you know, I haven't scuba dived once this year and I only went twice last year so I don't do it often but when I do it just means that you can go deeper and you can work with species like these pike that maybe you you'd struggle to work with in in other disciplines so i do quite enjoy that when i when i do do it but what i do a hell of a lot of is remote cameras so not quite camera traps but i'll put a camera in a river and then i'll maybe have a wire up to a laptop and i'll trigger it from uh, from that laptop so i'm able to take images of different subjects basically doing it that way so it's kind of um, slightly different I guess to what other people do but because I'm working with very specialist subjects I've had to kind of come up with new and, and different ways but it means for example like this trout if it's spawning then I'm not disturbing it because I'm putting the camera in then I'm leaving it trout gets used to the camera and I'm able to get images um, images that way so it's a great way of getting images of wildlife without disturbing them um, I've, I've snuck some dragonflies in uh, just because I thought I should should put some in so I went up to Scotland uh, last year in in the summer, and I never realised how how kind of how many species I've got in the Cairngorms and places like that. I think this is a black darter, but feel free to slap me on the wrist if I'm if I'm wrong on that. It's black and it looks like a darter is my rationale. Um, but it was it, I did see a lot of these, which I don't think we tend to get in England, or certainly not many of them. So that was nice to see a new species. And there is a a damselfly, which I, I know Fiona will know the species, but I can't remember off the top of my head. But there's a damselfly that they get. Um, up that way which you don't get anywhere else either I did see that one as well so that was quite nice to kind of tick off some some new species in, in that kind of thing um, 
photographing them i'm always looking for different ways i mean i see some amazing images people take of dragonflies in flight no idea how they do that because it's absolutely incredible the skill that must go into that and the patience because they're so quick um you know during the day typically i'll just do photography in the morning and i'll try and get them when they're a little bit cooler i like doing these wide angle shots where you can see more of the environment and it's basically a combination of going early or early-ish when they're not as active and moving very very slowly uh, towards the dragonfly and then that way they're not too uh, too difficult to get get images of so that's how i normally normally do it and also sometimes they will just let you approach them i mean it looks like i've super glued that dragonfly to to the bramble but it is just it's it's there its own volition i tend to find if you uh, if you stay the same shape so if you hunch your shoulders together hold the camera and move really really slowly i think it's something to do with the way the dragonfly's eyes work because they of the visions are obviously nothing like ours they don't notice you getting closer. So if you move very, very slowly, you can get within inches of them. You can get very, very close to them and get some uh, some pretty nice images. So although long lenses are pretty good, you can get up, you know, wide angle and, and macro lenses too. Um, I'm going to quickly mention kingfishers just because uh, whenever I'm by rivers and whenever, whenever I'm by ponds and things, I see them all the time. I take them for granted a little bit but it's trying to find a way of doing something a little bit different. So you see all these images of them perched on sticks and, and diving into ponds and, and doing backflips and all that kind of stuff. But I want to try and do something a little bit different. So I wanted to do a wide angle, but the Kingfisher didn't know this. So it decided to sit on the camera rather than the, the branch that I'd hoped to, to get it on, which was, you know, it was funny, but a bit frustrating. So I've, I'm very similar to what I'm doing underwater. I've got a cable that goes from the camera that goes into my uh, laptop. Eventually it did land on the stick and I was able to get this image, so a more of a wide angle shot. So I'm a big fan of these. It comes from being an underwater photographer because underwater, you only really use wide angle and macro. You don't use any other lenses. So I'd much rather have a shot where you see the habitat that the animal lives in than a, than a close up shot. Not that there's anything wrong with close up shots. It's just, this is my, my bread and butter. This is what I prefer, um, prefer to do. So to give you an idea, this is the, the laptop shot. And then you might be able to see the Kingfisher just through that. You can see the camera there anyway, just probably make out the orange blur of that. But it's a great piece of software, so I can take the shot. And it's taken a shot every now and again, just so they get used to it. And I thought, I can get closer. I want to get the camera closer to the Kingfisher. And this is literally a couple of inches away. It's right on the, on the lens. Um, so I was pretty happy with that. Just a slightly different different shot. But I don't tend to, I like birds, don't get me wrong, but I don't tend to do birds very often. But every now and again, I will, uh, I will do that. So I mentioned about uh, lockdown earlier and I was trying to think of during, during the first lockdown, I was trying to think of ways I could take unusual images and different images. And I thought, what about isolated shots of, of animals on just a white background? It's not normally something I would do, but because I didn't have anything on, I thought, well, I might as well do something to keep me busy. So I got a, a pond dipping tray and then I would put a light underneath it and then I'd put animals in the tray and take images that way. And while they're not kind of award-winning, they're great for ID, they're great for identification and showing off the features of those animals. So this is smooth new on a, on, a, on a white background, so that worked quite well. And it's just things I could find in my pond, basically, or, or I lived very close to a river at the time, so I'd take a little pond dipping net and I'd get things like bullheads and stuff like that. And I was very slowly building up a portfolio of just small animals on a white background. And it kept me entertained, it kept me busy anyway. Um, but it's something that, again, that if you wanted to try, it'd be very simple for you to do. So just a white tray and a light. And then I thought, well, can I do this, but try and make it a little bit more natural? So I put a stone in the tray, put some water in, and then I got a banded damozel uh, larvae. So I did the white background first. And I thought, okay, that's good. Shows the features really nicely. And then something a little bit more natural. So this is still done in that little tray, but I've got about an inch of water on top. And then the damozel is on the on the stone but it looks relatively natural so it was giving me lots of different options so it's quite fun to experiment with that um particularly now because a lot of my time's taken up well working which i shouldn't moan about i'm very grateful that i am working but i don't get to experiment with things i want to do very often so it was quite nice to do something like this and, and have a little uh, little play around with it and then i'm gonna say common data larvae but again i may be terribly wrong on that i think it's common data but this was out of my pond as well um, and I've just got a nice kind of collection of different invertebrates and small fish and things like that 
which made a kind of a nice little collage. So you can always find something to do uh, and to keep you busy and, and entertained. That's that basically was my my lockdown. And I did do some tank stuff with uh, Damozel uh, larvae as well. The river that's not too far from my house does have quite a lot of them in, so it's quite a kind of good ecosystem for those in there. So I got quite a nice collection of images of those. And then, as I mentioned, the dragonfly um, earlier that was laying eggs in, in my pond. This is, I think, it was one of these ones. I can't again. I think it's some kind of hawker or or emperor. I'm not a hundred percent sure on that. I should have probably brushed up my dragonfly knowledge before doing a talk to a dragonfly society, if I'm honest. But um, it's laying its eggs in the moss, and that made me realise that I should have a bit more varied habitat around the edge of my pond. So I've got some kind of mossy margins, um, and I've got some dead wood as well. I think dead wood's quite good for them, to a uh, to a degree as well um, and also kind of specifically for dragonflies put some stones around i know common darters typically like to kind of bask on stone so i have kind of catered my my own little pond um for for darters and things like that i've just realized i'm missing a wing i didn't notice that before something must have had a, had a pop at that um anyway that is a bit of a mishmash of um some of the stuff that i do kind of a a whirlwind tour and i think that's brought us up to three o'clock which is about right anyway so